Hidden talents. School districts in each of the specified multi-county regions are authorized to establish an alternative school for the education of at-risk students, including those students who have been expelled from public schools for reasons including, though not limited to, violence, weapons, violations, and disruptive behavior. Each alternative school will be subject to evaluation during its fifth year of operation. At the termination of the evaluation period, the Alternative Education Committee will report its findings to the State of Board of Education, along with recommendations for continuance, replacement, or dismantling of the program. I was interrupted by a knock on the door. A short kid wearing glasses with thick black frames stuck his head in. I brought back your magazine, he said to Torchy. Come on in, Torchy said. The kid walked in and handed a car magazine to Torchy. He turned to me and said, Hi, that's Dennis Wu, Torchy said, but everyone calls him Cheater. Cheater glared at Torchy. Not everyone, and it's a lie. I never cheat. I don't have to. He turned back toward me. Let me ask you this. Do I look like someone who needs to cheat on tests? He stood very still as if that would help me see what a wise and honest person he was. No, you look awfully smart, I told him. Heck, you look... So smart, I'd probably try to copy off your test. Maybe I can sit next to you in class. He grinned. Hey, thanks, you're okay, I shrugged. Apparently, the subtle art of sarcasm was wasted on him. I glanced over at Torchy, trying not to grin, but I couldn't help rolling my eyes toward the ceiling. Wait, I get it, Cheater said. You're playing with me, aren't you? You think I didn't know what you meant. Relax, I was just kidding. I didn't feel like making any more enemies even little ones with thick glasses. I held out my hand. No hard feelings? Cheater looked at me for a moment as if trying to decide whether I was going to play some kind of joke on him. Then he reached out to shake hands. As he did, I suddenly wondered whether he was going to flip me through the air. I guess my expression changed enough that he could figure out what was on my mind. Relax, he said. You look like you think I'm going to kung fu you or something. Talk about stereotypes. Just because I'm Chinese, you think I'm some kind of karate kid. Let me tell you, I don't know any of that stuff. I wish I did. We shook hands. I really was just kidding, I told him. Hey, I'm used to it, Cheater said. My ancestors have been kicked around for centuries. But you know what? I don't think people hate us because we look different. I think they hate us because we're smart. I have a cousin who gets beaten up at least once a week because he always gets 100s on his test. You see? That's why people hate us. Wow, I didn't want to get any deeper into that discussion. If someone hated you, did it really matter why? I didn't know. Maybe it mattered. At least there didn't seem to be any prejudice about who went to Edgeview. From that, I'd seen the place was about as mixed as any school I'd ever been to. Trouble was colorblind. I really do know lots of stuff, Cheater said. Ask me anything. Did you know karate started out in China? Then it went to Okinawa in the 1600s. Didn't get to Japan until 1910. Edgeview Alternative School was built in 1932, but it started out as a factory. They rebuilt it 20 years ago, but it's just been a school for the last four and a half years. He really does know just about everything, Torchy said. It's kind of amazing. Come on, ask me anything, Cheater said. I realized he wasn't going to stop until I asked him a question. Who invented radium? Marie Curie with her husband, Pierre, in 1898 for which they got the Nobel Prize in 1903. He stared at me as if I'd just asked him to spell cat. Come on, Torchy. Could have answered that one. Hey, Torchy said. Sorry, Cheater told him. He looked back at me. All right, I'd give him my hardest question. Who played the monster in Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein? That was a real stumper. Most people would guess Boris Karloff. They'd be wrong. Cheater didn't even blink. Glenn Strange, he said, giving the correct answer. Wow, I guess you really might know everything, except how to stay out of trouble. A bell rang in the hall. Dinner time, Torchy announced, getting to his feet like someone who had just been invited to take a stroll to the electric chair. I'll grab some seats, Cheater said, dashing out the door. They short on seats, I asked Torchy. He shook his head. No, Cheater just likes to be the first in line. Then he leaned over to whisper. Even though we were alone, he doesn't really need glasses, but he kept bugging his folks for them. Don't tell him I told you, okay? Sure. I followed Torchy out the door. How's the food? I asked as we walked toward the stairs. I noticed that nobody seemed to be in a rush. I scanned the halls for bloodbath and spotted him safely ahead of us. On a good day, it stinks, Torchy said, but you'll get used to it. We joined the herd shuffling toward the cafeteria on the first floor. 
Even from far off, as the smells reached me, I got the feeling Torchy wasn't kidding about the food. I grabbed a tray and went through the line with Torchy, letting a bored-looking woman with a net over her hair and clear plastic gloves on her hands give me a plate loaded with various piles of glop. I wondered if the gloves were for our protection or for hers. We wove our way between the round tables and seemed to have been dropped at random on the cracked linoleum floor, heading toward Cheater, who stood there signaling his success in getting some seats by waving one arm. As I followed Torchy to our spot near the far wall and plucked down on a wobbly plastic chair, I could see that the kids were split up into different groups, with anywhere from four to eight kids at a table. I guess there were about 200 kids altogether. Bloodbath was hanging out with a bunch of tough guys at a couple tables in one corner. Everything about them, clothes, hair, attitude, said, don't mess with us. The tables nearest them were empty. I guess nobody wanted to get too close to the sharks. On a hunch, I looked at the table farthest from Bloodbath. Yep, the smallest, most scared kids were all clustered there like a bunch of little bait fish. We used to have more tables, Torchy said, but they got rid of all the square ones last month. He almost had to shout. There was a lot more talking than eating going on around us, filling the room with noise that seemed to wash over me from every direction. Rectangles, Cheater said, correcting him. They were longer than they were wide, so that made them, yeah, whatever, Torchy said. Glared at Cheater. Anyhow, I guess they figured round tables would make us behave better or something. Fascinating. I turned my attention to choking down the food. It's hard to believe that anyone could ruin macaroni and cheese, but the school cooks had managed to do just that. And the potatoes were awful. These mashed potatoes really suck, I said. That's because they're turnips, Cheater explained, a popular food source in Germany before the introduction of the potato. I decided not to ask what the stingy green stuff was. Until now, I thought Mom was a pretty bad cook. Her idea of tomato sauce was ketchup with a dash of Parmesan cheese. As I ate, I realized she could have been far worse. And at least back home, we'd have takeout chicken once a week from Cluck Shack and lots of pizza. I guess I wouldn't be getting anything like that for a while. Between bites, I checked out my companions. Besides Torchy and Cheater, there were one. There was one other kid at our table. He looked pretty tough. Big shoulders, dark hair, eyebrows that seemed to want to grow together to form one furry strip across his forehead, and the beginnings of a stubbly beard threatening to burst through his skin. A year or two from now, I'd bet he'd, been, he'd be shaving twice a day. They called him Lucky. I almost laughed when I heard that. I didn't see how anyone who deserved that nickname could be stuck in a place like Edgeview. Unlucky was more like it, or maybe unfriendly. He didn't seem all that happy to meet me. Not that I cared. By the time I choked down half of the macaroni, I had the whole place figured out, except for one person. Dear Mom and Dad, I got a new roommate. He's cool. We get along great. I've been showing him around. He seemed kind of scared at first, but I guess that's normal. He looks kind of like Cousin Walter, you know, brown hair and blue eyes, but his nose is smaller. Well, I guess everyone's nose is smaller than Walter's. And he has both ears. Oh, yeah. His name is Martin. I'm working real hard and learning lots of stuff. Mr. Parsons said my last report was almost intelligible. That's exactly what he wrote. I guess that's good. And Miss Nomad told me I had a flair for spontaneous expression. That's exactly what she wrote, too, whatever that means. I'm still really sorry about the parrot, even though I didn't do it. Honest. I'm sure the feathers will grow back. Well, I guess that's it for now. Your son, Philip. I'd watch him on and off during the meal, and I didn't have a clue why he was by himself. Well, as my dad always said, if you don't know the answer, ask a question. Of course, whenever I asked him a question, he usually told me to shut up. But dad wasn't here, so I figured it was safe to ask a question. Who's the loner? I asked Torchy, looking over toward the kid eating all by himself at a table near the opposite wall. There was nothing I could see about his clothes or appearance that would explain his isolation. Him? That's trash. Nice name, I said. It's not like that. It's just that he trashes stuff. You know, breaks things. Yeah, Cheater said. I heard that at his last school, he smashed up a whole classroom. Desks, chairs, windows. The kid's wacko. I looked back at trash. It was hard to imagine why someone would break stuff for fun. Hey, Lucky said to Cheater, you shouldn't say wacko. It's not nice. Yeah, you're right, Cheater said. My mistake. He's not a wacko. He's bonkers. Or maybe he's loony. What about deranged? I like that one. How'd you like to be called that, Lucky asked. I think I'd prefer insane if you're going to tech, 
if you're going to if you're going for technical terms, Cheater said, but flipped out has a nice ring to it. And let's not forget all those wonderful phrases that can be used to indicate a mind that is somewhat less than perfect. One card short of a full deck, one sandwich short of a picnic, off your rocker, out in left field. The list goes on and on and on. Hey, do you know where the word bedlam comes from? It was a crazy house in England. Listen, Lucky told him, his voice dropping so low I had to lean forward to catch the rest of it. If enough people call you crazy, maybe you begin to believe it, If even if you aren't. All three of them started arguing about putting labels on people and about stuff like self-esteem. Everyone was talking at once. They sounded like a bunch of miniature psychiatrists. I guess that's gotten a lot of that in class here. Personally, I thought they were all a bit crazy, or wacko, or bonkers, but I kept my mouth shut. I couldn't do much about kids like Bloodbath who'd hate me because that was how they treated everyone, but I didn't want to turn the whole place against me. I didn't want to end up eating dinner all by myself every day like that pathetic loser they called trash. So I stayed exactly quiet and let them go at it. Eventually, the argument faded out and everyone went back to eating. Well, Cheater said as we finished our meal, welcome to Edgeview. I was about to say thanks when a crash from across the room made me jump. Nobody else seemed surprised. I realized Trash had thrown his plate down. It sounded like it had hit hard. I expected to see shattered pieces all over the floor, but the plate hadn't broken. He does that a lot, Torchy said. They give him a plastic plate so at least it doesn't break. I watched Trash to see what he would do next. I wondered if he'd throw his fork or maybe even his chair. Even though he was off on the other side of the room, I got ready to duck. But he just sat there. I couldn't see his face really well. He was hunched over and his hair hung down kind of long on the sides. But he didn't seem angry. He didn't seem happy either. He actually appeared kind of sad. Wacko, Cheater said. Lucky glared at him. What do you guys do after dinner, I asked as we got up from the table. There's a TV in the lounge, Torchy said, but Bloodbath and his gang hang out there. The library's not bad, Cheater added. And on Friday nights, we all play checkers, Lucky said. He cut off Cheater so quickly, I was sure they were hiding something. That was okay. I couldn't get angry over a secret or two. They didn't know me yet, and they had no way to tell whether they could trust me, just like I didn't really know yet if I could trust them. Yeah, Cheater said. That's what I was going to say. We play checkers. Yup, every Friday. That's what we do. A bell rang, signaling the end of dinner. Oh, crap, I said as it hit me. What? Torchy asked. Nothing. It wasn't a thought I felt like sharing, but I just realized my whole life was going to be measured by bells. When we got back to the room, I borrowed a magazine from Torture, Torchy. He had a great selection. Monster stuff, sports, comics, cars. Though some of them looked like they'd been snatched from a fire. I read for a while, then decided to go to sleep. We had to turn out our lights at 10, anyhow, so it wasn't like I was missing anything. Right about now, back home, I'd be saying goodnight to my sister. Good night, you spoiled brat, and she'd be saying good night to me. Good night, you creepy little twerp. It was a sort of ritual with us. Funny how in one day, home had turned into back home. Somewhere else, somewhere I wasn't. I could hear Torchy across the room breathing. Out in the hall, it sounded like something. someone was wrestling. The walls shook with the thud of a body hitting hard. Maybe it was a fight. I didn't care. It had nothing to do with me. Tomorrow was Monday. I'd get to find out firsthand what classes were like. Maybe these teachers would be better. Maybe I could get along with them. I closed my eyes and thought about the places I'd been before Edgeview. All of a sudden, the other schools didn't seem that bad. Sure, they'd been a lot of jerks to deal with, but I guess there were jerks everywhere. Maybe I was a jerk myself for getting kicked out so often. But this was it. Edgeview was the last place that would take me. This was the place for kids who had been thrown out, all, out of all the regular schools where they lived. Six counties in the northern part of the state had gotten together to make this dump. There was nowhere to go from here. Edgeview was my dead end. Dennis Wu. Magnus Cranium was the strongest man in the Legion of Ultra Heroes. He was also the smartest. Magnus could solve any problem with his incredible brain. One time, the supervillain Rotten Man trapped Magnus in a room made of titanium steel covered with an electric field and rigged with 50 atom bombs. No problem, Magnus said. It, I can cope. Did he hit the walls? No. Did he push against the door? No. Magnus sat and thought, and the answer came to him. He saw the way out. It's too complicated to describe because Magnus is so smart. It would be hard to understand, especially since it involved quantum mechanics and advanced particle physics and maybe some karate. But he did it.
A bell woke me. Good morning, Torchy called from across the room in a dis- disgustingly cheerful voice. I coughed a couple times as I sat up, wondering why my lungs felt like I spent the night in an ashtray. The answer sat in the bottom of my wastebasket. I stared at the charred ball of burned paper that had once been a student handbook. Hey, are you trying to kill us? I asked Torchy. I didn't do nothing, he said. Right, there was no port art point arguing. We just get into one of those did not did two things that don't go anywhere. So I dropped it and got ready for my day at Edgeview. My first class after breakfast was math. When I reached the door, Cheater waved to me from the middle of the empty room. I got us some seats, he said. Thanks. I plucked down next to him. I was afraid I'd have to stand. I'm not going to copy off of you, Cheater added. Everyone says I do, but I don't. Fine. I didn't care if he copied from me. Torchy grabbed the seat on my other side. He'd sort of attached himself to me. That was okay. I didn't mind sticking with someone who knew what was going on. And compared to a lot of the kids I'd seen, he was reasonably normal, if he didn't count a slight problem with fire. Besides, he was so relentlessly friendly that being mean to him would be like kicking a puppy. He didn't act like those kids who ask, will you be my friend? Now, those kids I don't mind kicking. With Torchy, it was more like he was saying, I'm going to be your friend. I didn't see any point fighting it. Bloodbath wasn't in my math class, but I saw three kids just like him sitting in the back row. They all had the same deadly look. One had rings in his nose and in both eyebrows. He might have had a ring in his tongue, too, but I really didn't want to get close enough to see for sure. I didn't even want him to catch me looking in his direction. His buddy had a tattoo of a skull on his forehead. It looked like he'd done it himself. Just the thought of a needle being jabbed over and over into my flesh made me shudder. I wondered if his pea-sized brain realized the humor of putting a skull on the outside of his own skull. Probably not. The third beast in that cluster of thugs had grunge tattooed on the back of each hand. As far as I could tell, none of them carried any books to class. Here comes Mr. Parsons, Torchy whispered as the teacher stepped into the room. Careful, he got a bit of a temper. A teacher with a temper? Now, that was a shock. I watched Mr. Parsons walk to his desk. He looked pretty much like any of a million other middle-aged math teachers except for the long strands of hair that he'd comb over the top of his head from the side. He was wearing a rumbled green jacket, rumbled green pants, and a blue tie. Not a bow tie, but still, I didn't trust him. Good morning, class, he said. There was no answer but about half of the kids at least glanced in his direction. One kid, I learned later that they called him Flying Dan, was running around at the back of the room with his arms spread out like airplane wings. Another was carving something on his desk with his pen. At least he was doing that until the pen snapped from the pressure. A couple kids stared out the windows, and I guess I was looking all around the room at everyone else. Mr. Parsons cleared his throat. I faced forward and tried to escape his notice. Be cool, I told him. I told myself. Just sit back and get through it. That was my plan. Well, now I see we have a new student, Mr. Parsons glance, said, glancing down at a sheet of paper he'd taken from his lesson book. He scanned the room until his eyes landed on me. Not a, ch- not a tough trick to pull off since I wasn't a moving target like Flying Dan. Martin, why don't you tell the class something about yourself? I shrugged. There's really nothing to tell. I hated the whole new kid's song and dance routine. Stand up, stutter a bit, say something, totally stupid, sit down. What did he think I was, a dancing dog? Come on, don't be modest. Surely you have something interesting to share. I shook my head. At least I wasn't the center of attention. In this class, there was no center of attention. I was just one bubble in a glass of cola, clinging on the side while a giant soda straw of a teacher tried to stir things around and suck us up. Parsons shuffled over to me and smiled a thin smile. His upper lip was nearly the same pasty color as his forehead. The head reminded me of the belly of a dead fish. Now, Martin, one of the basic things we've discovered at Edgeview is that the students must learn to be open and honest about themselves. Open and honest. That's the key. Please stand up and share something. He leaned over and patted me on the shoulder, then returned to the front of the class and crossed his arms. His whole body said, I'm waiting. It looked like there was no way out. I stared at him standing straight ahead of me, acting all powerful and filled with expert ideas and theories about what was right for us poor little students. Open and honest? As I rose to my feet, I realized that that was the perfect description. I honestly had no idea what was going to come out when I opened my mouth. Hi, my name is Martin Anderson and I'm not bald. I sat I sat back down. Mr. Parsons' face grew red. Even the top of his scalp 
through the strands of combed over hair turned the color usually only seen in ripe garden tomatoes. His face wasn't just changing color, it was also twitching, like in the monster movies right before a guy turns into a werewolf. I expected him to start shouting, but he whirled away from me, fumbled around the for some chalk, and wrote the lesson on the board. He broke three pieces before he was finished. I glanced over at Torchy. He held his finger up like a knife and ran it across his throat. Then he flopped his tongue out, closed his eyes, and dropped his head onto one shoulder. I guess that was his subtle way of telling me I'd probably not make a good first... I probably not made a good first impression on Mr. Parsons. Way to go, Cheater whispered. Yeah, way to go. The class itself was pretty strange. I guess it was some kind of experimental teaching method. The idea seemed to be that we would learn math better if we didn't have to spend so much time memorizing stuff and just use numbers in lots of different ways. I wasn't sure whether it would work, but I was willing to give it a try, and I certainly didn't want to get any further out on Mr. Parsons' bad side, if that was possible. So I paid attention. I even raised my hand once or twice, though he didn't call on me. Things didn't, say pe- things didn't stay peaceful for long. About halfway through class, Mr. Parsons handed back some tests. When Cheater got his, he shouted, It's not fair! He jumped up, knocked over his desk, kicked his chair, and rushed from the room. Nobody paid any attention, not even the teacher. I glanced at the tests where it had landed on the floor. On top, written in red pen, there was a large F. Then I looked over at Torchy. He'll be back, Torchy said. Sure enough, Cheater returned a couple minutes later, acting as if nothing had happened. He put his desk back and sat down. The bell rang. Wow, you sure know how to blend in, Cheater said as we were leaving for our next class. He raced ahead. Yeah, Torchy said. Parsons looked like he wanted to strangle you. I shrugged. He'll get over it. I didn't really say anything all that bad. I hope the other teachers aren't that sensitive. Is his class always like this? Torchy shook his head. Parsons keeps trying different stuff. Last month, we had to learn a bunch of songs about fractions. There's this one jingle I still can't get out of my head. You're kidding. He shook his head. I wish I was. Before I could ask him about our next class, someone punched me in the shoulder hard enough to to knock me into the wall. For official use only, new student preliminary evaluation form. Student name, Martin Anderson, evaluation, a vicious and destructive boy. That's my impression. He'll require close watching. I've met few students who are as as unruly and ill-mannered. Evaluator, Mr. Luther Parsons. The Edgeview Express, dated five years ago. Dear Editor, I am firmly against the establishment of an alternative school in our town. We do not need problems like this. What will happen to our streets? Nobody will be safe. Edgeview should not be the dumping grounds for other people's problems. Signed, Mrs. Clarice Pitowski. Hey, I shouted. Bloodbath, passing by in the other direction, glanced back and grinned. I guess the punch was his way of saying hello. It would have been nice to return the greeting with a baseball bat, but there didn't seem to be one handy. I waited until he was out of sight before I rubbed the sore spot. Torchy didn't even seem to notice. I guess punches from bloodbath in the hallway were as common as mosquito bites near a swamp. A pain in the butt at times, but nothing unusual. Torchy stopped in front of an open door, decorated with a picture of Shakespeare taped to the lower half. Here we are, English class. You'll like Miss Nomad. I followed Torchy inside where we grabbed the seats Cheater had saved for us. Between them, I felt like I was sitting in a box full of puppies. As the bell rang, Miss Nomad swept into the room, her long skirt brushing the floor, her long brown hair brushing past her shoulders and flowing all the way to her waist. She wished us a cheery good morning, smiling as if today were the most wonderful day in the world and we were the most fabulous students a teacher could wish for. She was so young, I figured she couldn't have been teaching for more than a year or two. She zapped a huge grin in my direction and said, Welcome to the class, Martin. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Feel free to join in the discussion. 
Oh, man. She reminded me of some kind of life-size talking animal from a cartoon. She beamed an even bigger smile in my direction. It looked like she had more teeth than anyone could ever actually need. I waited for her to say, tell us something about yourself. I would have bet a million bucks she'd do that next. But she just picked up a book and started the lesson. Perfect. I relaxed and sat back. Maybe we get along just fine. Everyone groaned when she pulled out a book of poetry, but I sort of liked the first part of the poem she read to us. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. I actually felt a chill when she read that. I didn't completely understand it, and I sure didn't understand the rest of the poem, but those two lines sounded pretty cool. I told you she was nice, Torchy whispered. Yeah, maybe this class would be okay. Unlike math, English class went well for almost 10 minutes. At that point, we were talking about writing. Writing is such a wonderful way to express yourself, Miss Nomad said, and the best part is that anyone can write. She had a habit of walking all around the room as she talked, as if she were weaving herself among our desks. It made me feel like I was a part of one of those pot holders, kids making craft classes. I was getting a sore neck from watching her. At the moment she was passing right by me, as she said the word anyone, she gave me this look that seemed to say, yes, Martin, even poor little you can scrawl meaningful words. She almost seemed to expect a poem to burst from my forehead move on lady i thought she stayed where she was her smile burning a hole through my face all that talk about only sharing when i feel like it that was obviously a pile of crap she wasn't going to budge until i spilled some warmth i raised my hand martin you have something to contribute miss nomad asked that's wonderful i'm so glad you have chosen to participate yeah, maybe anyone can write, but won't some people stink at it? I mean, anyone can paint, but most people really stink at that. I know I do. The last painting I tried looked like dog puke, and the same for playing the violin or making a chair. Have you ever heard someone who's really bad on the violin? It's not very pleasant, and I sure wouldn't trust my butt sitting in any chair I'd made with these two hands. She sort of gulped. In my mind, I saw the human goldfish that suddenly found herself stranded on a dry land. Then the smile returned. But that's the wonderful thing about writing. Nobody else can judge your work. As long as you think it's good, that's all that matters. She leaned over and stared at me with those big eyes, giving me that I may be a teacher, but I understand you look. Can't you see how wonderful a thing that is? She asked. Can I see that you're a fruitcake? I almost let it go, but I couldn't. She was wrong. I had an uncle who was always trying to write books. He'd send them out, and they'd come back three or four months later with a printed slip that said, no thanks, not even nice try or good effort, just no thanks, which I think really meant, your book truly sucks. Please leave us alone. I tried to read some of his, of his stuff once. It really stunk big time. Talk about dog puke. Nothing ever happened. People just sat around and discussed life. Everyone drank coffee and felt bad about things they'd done in the past. I had a feeling Uncle Stan would write books for the next thousand years, and he'd still stink. I looked up at Miss Nomad. He, she seemed so happy and eager for us to share the joys of writing. It matters, I said. People might say that just th say they just write for themselves. That's a lie. Everyone wants to show off, and if you stink, you can't show off, can you? Because nobody will buy what you write, so you're just lying to yourself. I stopped talking. I didn't care either way. Why was I even bothering to say anything? Miss Nomad gulped again, a bit louder, then said, Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts, Martin. I had the funny feeling she didn't like me. Bad mood, cheater. Bad move, cheater whispered to me a minute later. She's always trying to tell sell her poems. She keeps sending them to magazines. She got hundreds of them, Torchy said. Boxes full. And, I asked, hasn't sold a single one, Cheater told me. She sh He shook his head. Sometimes she reads them to us. He made a face and pinched his nose. Yipes. I should have figured that out before I opened my big mouth. I could just imagine Miss Nomad, fountain pen in hand, sitting at a desk jammed in the corner of some small room, filling page after page with bad poetry. I didn't think she'd hold it against me the way Parsons did, but I'd certainly made sure I wouldn't be the teacher's pet in this class. Miss Nomad pretty much ignored me for the rest of the period. It beca I became the invisible boy. Hey, that could be a nickname for me. Glass boy. See right through me. I'm not really here. When the bell rang, I checked my schedule. I had Jim next. That would be more like it. Jim would be fun. Jim would be nice and normal. Just run around and sweat. No matter how modern they got in their teaching methods, I didn't see how they could mess with something as simple as Jim. On the other hand, it's amazing what adults can do when they set their minds to it. 
Priscilla Nomad, a poem. A single grain of mighty sand, I hold it lovingly in my hand. Gentle orb, so small and simple, a single grain, oh wondrous sand, who came perhaps from a foreign land, I speck no bigger than a pimple. The locker room was just a hallway next to the gym with double doors on each end. There were two long rows of dark green lockers and a couple of wooden benches that looked like they'd been borrowed from a cheap picnic table. The place smelled a lot like the cheese section of the supermarket. I found a new pair of gym shorts and a shirt waiting for me in a paper bag that had Anderson written on it. I also found Bloodbath in the locker room, but he was busy horsing around with a couple of his buddies and stuffing one of the runs into a locker. I wondered whether he had some sort of checklist. If he, if he did, hit the new kid could be marked off for the day along with cram small kid in locker. The main thing was that I hadn't become the focus of his attention. I was definitely ready for some exercise. There's nothing like a good sweat to make a guy feel happy. I followed the rest of the class out of the locker room and into the gym. That's Mr. Acropolis, Torchy said, pointing to a man standing in the mil middle of the floor. The guy looked like someone who used to lift weights but had given up exercise a year or two ago. His muscles were still there, but they were starting to drip. I checked around the gym to see what we were going to play. There wasn't any nets up, so it wouldn't be volleyball. And there weren't any mats, so I figured we wouldn't be wrestling. Mr. Acropolis blew his whistle and then said, Have a seat, class. Everyone dropped to the floor. I figured he was going to give us some sort of talk. Maybe he rolled out a chalkboard and teach us football plays. I wasn't even close. Now, breathe slowly and empty your minds, he said. Then he stopped talking while we breathed slowly and tried to empty our minds. Mine kept filling up at first, but that was... But that was sort of cool, too, since I passed a good chunk of time imagining what I could do to bloodbath if I had a laser cannon. I saved a couple of shots for Mr. Parsons, too. This is Jim, I whispered to Torchy after I got tired of slicing bloodbath into convenient pieces for easy storage. Yeah, he whispered back. Kind of weird, but we get to do what we want for the last 15 minutes. Actually, I hated to admit it, but the empty mind thing was sort of relaxing once I got the hang of it. Of course, Flying Dan didn't stay still for long, and a couple of the others didn't seem to enjoy sitting in one place. Every five minutes or so, someone would make a farting noise. A couple of kids would laugh, and Mr. Acropolis would blow his whistle. Then things would settle down for a bit. Most of the farts were fake, at least, though Hindenburg let one loose that made everybody rush to the other side of the room. Bloodbath and his friends horsed around the whole time, but the teacher didn't seem to care. As we were finishing up, Mr. Acropolis went around telling us all what a great job we'd done. Then he asked, what do you want to play? A bunch of kids shouted dodgeball. That was fine with me. I liked dodge dodgeball. There was a wonderful satisfaction in smacking someone nice and hard with a fairly harmless ball. Of course, it's no fun getting smacked, but that wasn't a big problem for me. I managed to see most of the hard throws before they could hit me, and I didn't do too badly during the first game. I also made sure I was on the same side as Bloodbath. As I expected, he really liked to aim for the head, even though Mr. Acropolis kept telling everyone not to. I got eliminated early in the second game, so I had to stand on the side of the gym and watch. Torchy was next to next to me. He was the first one to get out in both games. It's like he was a ball magnet. I noticed one player on the other team was really good at dodging. Who's that? I asked Torchy, pointing to a tall skinny kid who didn't seem to ever get hit. That's Flinch, he said. He's really good at dodgeball, but he's pretty jumpy. He usually eats with us, but he went home for the weekend. I watched Flinch. Every once in a while, you run across a true artist. I known one kid, Stevie Minetti, who made the best card houses I've ever seen. He would pile up three or four decks of cards into these great castles. Nobody else I knew even came close. And there was this girl down the block from me. She could climb trees like she was born in the woods. And of course, I'd run across the kid who did other stuff like paint or dance or play the piano. Those kids were true artists. So was Flinch. He was the best dodgeball player I'd ever seen. He almost always managed to get out of the way. Even after the rest of his team was blasted off the floor, he kept going. One ball, no problem. Two at once, piece of cake. Even three. Flinch jumped and twisted and ducked. 
The balls shot past and smacked into the wall behind him. The cool thing was that he had his hair in dozens of little braids like a rap singer, and every time he jerked or twisted, the hair flew like a bunch of exclamation points. Finally, in an unusual display of teamwork, about five kids on the other side threw it once. There was no way Flinch could avoid getting hit, but he gave it a good try. He leaped and twisted like the star of a dolphin show, but one of the balls clipped his foot. Mr. Acropolis blew the whistle again. Jim was over. Score one for me. I'd gotten through a whole class without messing with the teacher. Of course, Mr. Acropolis had never given, even given a sign that he knew I was there. It was time for lunch next. They do anything strange during the meal, I asked Torchy. Sometimes, he said, for a while, Principal Davis read to us while we ate, and sometimes we play music, but lunch is lunch. And there really isn't too much they can do to mess with it. It was He was right. Lunch was pretty normal, except that the food was just as awful as it had been at dinner and breakfast. I guess that was normal for Edgeview. After lunch, it was time for science, which I was looking forward to since I heard so much about Mr. Briggs.